Okay, guys, we've got Justin and Aaron here. Justin, right? Mm -hmm. Justin and Aaron, two young filmmakers, pretty cool story. They made this movie called The Resolution. Um, watched the movie the other day. Thank you for letting me get, give me a link to watch it. Uh, great production, scary for me, Good. but uh, gripping. I mean, you do not want to turn it off. You do not want to walk away from it. We want to know your story. How did you guys meet? How did this project come about? Is this your first movie? Uh, it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, uh, okay. We, we, we each have about we have about ten years each of like filmmaking experience individually. When you say filmmaking experience, doing what? Mostly do it yourself, but okay. we've also both directed bigger commercials and we've both yeah. directed everything in between. Yeah, and I was also I was a DP when I got out here for a while too, so I, I was also the DP of okay. Resolution. Um, and uh, but also you know directed additionally. Yeah. So you were doing mm -hmm. other stuff. Yeah, yeah. We well we both do we do everything. We like to do everything. It's not like hey give me any job. It's like we we prefer to. So you guys wrote movie. this story too, right? Uh, he wrote. You wrote the story. Yeah. And then you co-directed it. Exactly. Okay, we'll get to that. So, sure. how did you guys meet? Mm -hmm. how did we known each other for from childhood, uh, a long time? Sure. sure. Yeah. Um, well, basically, I moved out uh, four years ago. I moved out to Los Angeles from, from Florida. Okay. And uh, graduated film school, Florida State. And uh, oh. and I got okay. like, I got one of my absolute like dream jobs as an intern for Ridley Scott's commercial production company. I was okay. like Ridley Scott, like oh my yeah. gosh, he's a yeah. hero. You know, come to find out being an intern is moving papers around and desperately okay. hoping someone asks you to get lunch for them and otherwise just sitting around and doing nothing, you know. But he taught me that on the first day because it was his last day. Wait, so wait, he met your last day at Ridley Scott's production. Yeah, yeah. My last day as an intern. As an intern. As an intern. And yeah. it was there in your first, first day. Yeah. And that's yeah. when you guys met. Yeah, we met. And I said, you know, mm -hmm. I, like he said, I want to be a writer, director, producer. And, uh, and I said, I want to be a director, DP. And, um, you know, like, he's like, I might have something for you. And a few months later, he's like, hey, can you come help so, out on this thing? And then we started working together. So. Cool. When you were leaving Ridley Scott, was it to get a paid job with Ridley or were you moving on? Oh, no, no, that was moving on to bus tables. Or the moving on to, to bigger Bus. things. Yeah, 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 yeah. You almost got me a job. Busing tables. Busing tables. Busing a bar. It was yeah, bar so back. I, remember I was so back. excited to get yeah, that yeah. job too. I was like, like oh so god, bad. I get to pick up dirty uh, But you got a paid glasses. gig. You needed a paid gig. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> several, yeah. several. I know a lot of people can move out to LA and just live on unpaid internships. They just like feed on Yeah, yeah, yeah we've yeah. got a few customers uh, like that. <laughs> but, okay, so you guys have this brief meeting, your last day, your first day. Yeah. And the friendship continued. Yeah. You, yeah. You said you've got a project. You may have something. Well, it was cool. And it was on. cool. Yeah. We just kind of worked on things like more and more collaboratively. And we, you know, the, the thing that really happened that solidified resolution was we we worked together on a uh, a low budget beer commercial. Um, and and it's, it it kind of has this, this energy to it. If you see the commercial, it's like it's a longer thing, but it's got this really interesting energy because the two lead actors are the two leads from Resolution. And then it's the first time he and I were like really closely working on something together. Okay, and so it's just, all these guys yeah. you had met on other projects. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so when, when we made that, he decided like that worked really well. I've got enough money to make, you know, make a movie for very little, but we can make a movie. And, um, and you know, so we wrote the script around what we had. And then he approached me with the script and said, will you develop this project with me? Will you co-direct it with me? And I said, hell no. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I jumped right on board, of course. Yeah. Um, so you guys weren't actors. You didn't come to Los Angeles to be actors. No. Came here to be filmmakers. Yeah. Does it do seem like it? Which I, no, which I you're, feel one like you. you're one of the few. You're one of the few. Okay. The, the, the only thing harder than coming to Los Angeles wanting to be an actor is wanting to be a director. Yeah. Because yeah. when we look at any given production, it's like, how many actors are in the piece? Whole shit. Oh, absolutely. And, and like, yeah. how, many, how many directors are there? There's one. one right. Now, granted, there aren't as many people here wanting to be right. directors, and but it's also, still a yeah, tough yeah. The flip side yeah. of that, because it's, it's you're completely correct, but there is the flip side of like, a director who is a director can direct anything, but an actor can't play every role. Okay. You know, so there is still like a slots versus thing. It's a it's a weird thing, but it's it is it is really hard to come out here and be a director. The other reason being that it's really hard to be a director for hire out here. You can't yeah. make a money off it. You can be an actor for hire and eventually, but direct director for hire, holy crap! You have to pry money out of anybody for anything. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So. How long did it take you to write this script? Did you have it for a while in your head? I mean, I'm sure you did. There, then you, there, there are some ideas in the script that go back like longer than, than ten years. Like I wrote them down as a teenager. Some ideas in the script, but okay. then, but for the most part, it was written in the six months preceding principal photography. 
Okay. And, uh, and, and also, I should also say that like, even though it's like, oh, yeah, Justin, you wrote it, right? It's like, yeah, I, I, I write the stuff we do, but Aaron is... Is a, is a key part of that writing process. Like, it's a, when we first started we're, uh, doing stuff together, but I'd write a short film and show it to him. I was like, oh, can you do some cinematography on this? And he gave me back script notes. And those script notes are really what made, like, it, it just the small adjustments made the script so much better. Okay. And it's, it, him and I collaborate quite a bit in the writing process. And it's a smooth, great collaboration. I mean, yeah, yeah we're yeah. fine. Yeah. We can talk stuff through without ego. It's not really one of those things like like it's, I mean it's like it's like in a being in a like a good relationship with a girl it's like you, when you're saying something say like it's not huh there, there is, is. There is. They, they exist <laughs> but, you know, but the idea is like when you say something it's like you know you put up an idea and you're saying like that idea isn't good but that when you, when you can say it in a, in a way with respect yeah. it, it doesn't mean your ideas aren't good it just means one. that one doesn't work why? Because we're trying to make the best thing possible cool. you know so now you got this script you're on board you want to make this movie together how do you get funding for this uh that's a very good question and i well prostitution isn't legal so it's hard to talk about on camera it's okay yeah, we yeah, let yeah. it out yeah. <laughs> yeah. we do some fun editing here where it goes to black and comes back and i'm like yeah so and then i got out of the car yeah. and it was cool uh, <laughs> but um but uh no i i actually i firmly believe that if you want to do something wildly unique or actually been somewhat original and you don't want to make zombie movie number one million and one mm -hmm. and you don't want like oversight you don't want this yeah. person that, that has a lot of money but no good ideas yeah. telling you what to do because they want to be the director that's right if, yeah and, and, and you know and also too like people investing money you owe them something to make their investment secure and a lot of times that's looking at zombie movie number one million to prove that zombie num movie number one million and one is a secure investment right, right. right? so uh, I firmly believe that if you really want to make a mark and you want to do something wildly unique, you don't want to do a movie about zombies, vampires, werewolves, then you're probably going to have to pay for it yourself. Yeah. And that's, that's what we did. I, I took, one, one day, literally one day I woke up and I realized that I had enough money from busting tables and bar backing and, production really? and working as a production assistant that given the fact that Aaron and I are very self-sufficient and that we could probably just do most things ourselves, and I say that we collaborate with a lot of really talented people. Sure. But we do, as far as filmmakers go, we do more than most people do. So he, he lives what is like, like a Swede. Yeah, like he, I, he, I, I, he owns like seven things. You know, yeah. so it's it's like you know, it lives in a little apartment. But you know, so it's just like, I mean, I'm not saying it was easy in any way for him yeah. to save up that money, but and, it's just like yeah, it makes sense. Really, what happens to psychologically when when you come to that and you're like, well, we want to be directors, really, really bad of a project that we're proud of and something we really believe in. And it's like, well, okay, we have the money to do it. It's not even scary just taking all that money and putting it on red, so to speak, and just like, fuck it, let's gamble, let's do yeah. it. Because you just feel like, look, I could get hit by a fucking car tomorrow. Anything could go wrong, and I wouldn't have that money anymore. And this lifetime dream of doing this project would be gone. Would be or or be starting over, you know? Five to ten years more of working shit jobs trying to get that money. So when we were there, it was just like, this is the obvious no-brainer decision. We're just going to do this. Mm -hmm. And, and, and never... to be yeah, and, and considering that it was his bank account more yeah. or less, it was pretty amazing to see him really separate himself from that money. That was not his money. That was production's that was production. money. And even though it cost was his money, money, but he could right. I mean, but it was it was it was pretty like impressive. I don't have that in me to like you know. But he's just like he's like yeah, I'm gonna reimburse all gas. Uh, just like and just did it like offered it like really willingly. Never tried to save money that otherwise shouldn't be saved. You know, yeah. like if it's like oh the right thing to do here is to then pay for this. He just did it. It separated it. It's like yeah, we can cut that corner, but it's not pretty like really impressive. All the people producing. working on the project friends. Or do you hire people? Some people were hired. Like uh, some of the supporting cast, you know, other than you know, the script is written for Pete and Benny. The supporting cast, those are all people that auditioned for us for the most yeah. part to yeah. get the roles. And they so get paid. They got paid. Okay. They got paid. Everybody got paid. Everybody yeah. got paid. Yeah. Screen uh, Actors Guild offers yeah. offer something called SAG Ultra Low Budget. Yes. So we were able to pay them, and you pay their health and pension as well, and all that stuff. And then, um, and then everyone else, the crew was basically. Some of them came from people that I had worked with exclusively. Some of them came with people that Aaron had worked with exclusively. The people that had crossed over on projects we had already done. Mm -hmm. And from that, uh, one guy, really, one it. person came just straight off a recommendation. Actually, two, Shablon, too. Yeah, uh, they, they did right. not know them at all from previous right. projects. Right, but they went to my. Whatever. They had gone to my film school, and the, so one of the people I was like, "Please come on this project." Okay. Like, I'm unavailable. Okay, well, alma mater and yeah. the same school and all. So you, you decided, the two of you, you're going to make this movie. How do you decide you're going to co-direct it? I mean, that's kind of unique, too, that you got both of you. It's a question for you, really. Directing it. 
I like I said, they got all yet to me. So. Uh, yeah. We had worked together on, again on a, on a short film called AM that turned out really well, and the way that even though Aaron was technically the cinematographer on that project, sure. we collaborated more like co-directors in the project. You know, a lot of people have that relationship with their DP, but him and I had that relationship over and over and over again, starting with that short film through commercials, and it just seemed like. What? So you did all the DP work on the movie. Yeah, and I prefer it. You, I, yeah. That's the only way I work. I, so now I you start it. you start casting this movie and you start getting actors and you start rehearsing. Yeah. Rehearsal was really actually pretty cool because because we had access to our incredible actors, you know, um, Pete and Vinny, they uh, they actually would donate like one or two days a week or three days a week to to rehearsal, like intense rehearsal. So that was really, was it three yeah. or six months that you guys rehearsed? It was, like, yeah, it was three months. Three yeah. months you guys rehearsed. And, uh, and actually sometimes we'd actually go to locations like three hours away and just rehearse in the space, you know. Where did we you shoot this? I was curious, where, where did you shoot this movie? Uh, uh, deep East County, San Diego, in a little town called Descanso. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. San Diego is really interesting because, um, at least I grew up in metropolitan area San Diego, like San Diego, San Diego, not mm -hmm. Oceanside, not North County. Not South County, like San Diego, the city. Okay. And it's interesting because a lot of people don't know this. I've taken Aaron. Aaron's seen the tour. You go from roughly downtown San Diego or like 30th Street uptown, mm -hmm. and it turns into like gnarly, like <laughs> the definition of a ghetto. Yeah. Like it's it's pretty. Well, gnarly. Gaslamp District and all used to be What's the ghetto. Used to be. One, no, no, that place is highly high end. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but you go just east of there, and you keep going, and you go through about oh, I'd say like. 5th through 68th Street. It's kind of ghetto. Like, all the way through. And then you get to you get to my, my parents' house. My parents are just, just on the, up, the, the shell of that. And then it turns into um, the suburbs for, like, a little while. And then it turns into the fucking Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> it goes from being, like, urban Wait, ghetto yeah. to yeah. suburbs for about five minutes into, like... The boobies. Uh, wake, yeah. wake and Fright, an obscure Australian exploitation movie, or <laughs> Texas Chainsaw Massacre, or any, like, rural horror film. It's that. It's so that the, odd, the, the house, unnerving. the abandoned house in your movie, the location was that just a really an abandoned house. That our our cabin in the woods and that that property is actually owned by my family. Okay. So you know one of one of the keys to, to getting an indie film done smoothly is uh, is to a not have to pay your location fees, permits, or anything, and on top of that, um, if you're blood related to the people who own the property. It can be very helpful because they feel yeah. worse about kicking you out for going yeah. over and being loud. And, feel a little and, So uh, rehearsals in Los Angeles or in San Diego? Both. Both. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, also, Vinny, Vinny Curran uh, is the lead, from... One of the leads. Yeah, one of the leads. Yeah. Yes, he's from San Diego and lives there. So, you know, we for his sake, but also for us to get to the location and feel that... Because obviously it's got kind of this thing about it, you know, it's got this, this aura, I guess, yeah. a weird place... Because not even like, oh, that's a cabin in the woods. You think of a cabin in the woods, you get this mental image from the Evil Dead. Mm -hmm. And it's not that. It's like it's a halfway finished, like nice little house that's just halfway finished. It's and really when weird. you're doing rehearsals, is it only lines? Are you doing camera blocking and you're doing all kinds of? We 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 blocked it. We did. We, we, we blocked it with with the caveat that look, guys, uh, given the camera setup and the lighting for that day, this could change. It could change. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we did. We we blocked it in terms of like their physical interaction, but and you know, and trying to make sure there's not like super clunky, you know, moves of like getting out the taser and like making it work, you know. Um, but the idea of the naturalism of the movie of, of making all that work was uh, was to try and make it look as unrehearsed as possible. So you see them kind of mess up the blocking on like not not. Like on purpose, they don't mess up, you yeah. know. But it, it feels natural, like what a human would do is like you drop stuff and you make little mistakes and, and stuff. And we like that. We kept that on the camera. Why so much rehearsal? Just so that you can here's, speed up the principal photography? Here's the or? idea. Yes, yes, but that's not the main idea. The the big idea behind our big rehearsal is is and we do this for every single movie. It's actually it's a deal it's, breaker. It's actually it's our one thing we don't bend on. Ever. Yeah. For no matter, I mean, if we got Tom, if Tom right Cruise said, I'll do your movie but no rehearsals, I'd be like, Done. I'm sorry, man. Like I'd love you, but no. so we're gonna watch. Oh, sorry, we're gonna watch this video 10, 15 years from now. Yeah, Tom Cruise. Oh, oh man, Tom, Tom Cruise so totally did that. that. <laughs> you know, but the the idea is, if you can, if if you as an actor, it's a psychological idea. It's like you get you get the lines cold, mm -hmm. you get the lines cold, you get the actions cold, you get the motivation behind everything cold, and then you just don't think about it for a little while. So basically, we didn't rehearse for like two weeks or three weeks before product principal photography. 
And the point is to just let it sink in, let it get into behind your head, you know, but you're not thinking about it anymore, about why you're doing stuff. And the, the basic idea is muscle memory. And, and I'm sure that there's some acting technique that, that, that is called that. Yeah. But we didn't. We don't study that. We just. That's just makes sense. You get a bit of a documentary yeah. feel to it because it's yeah. like second nature. You've been rehearsing this and doing this. And, right. Yeah. Um, and it's. It, I mean, for us too. It, it's also. It's like when you see a film by us. When you see a Moorhead and Benson film, that that style of performing is like our signature tone. It's like a conversational tone where you're not mm-hmm. trying to to really force some stylistic acting decision on the actor because that's what you had in your head. It's about finding the moment where it's like, that's two people talking. Mm. That is, I believe, that is two people two talking. Entertaining people. Two enter- yeah, two this is entertaining people. You want to hear the story, believe, you're right. drawn into yes. the story. Then. Mm. This sounds like two people having a conversation. Yeah, no, not, 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 as a viewer, you're a little bit voyeuristic. It's like yeah. you're, you're, you're dropping in on this conversation. Right. Yeah. And that's not, you know, I mean, that's not to say, like, there's no, there's no, like big time improvisation in our film, you know, it's pretty much. And when I say big time, I mean like sometimes the line will add a man or a dude or an F sure. word or like be slightly changed. But you know, he wrote the whole script. The whole yeah, I mean yeah. he wrote You're the whole pretty, script. Pretty true to the script he wrote. Yeah, what you said. That's no. just a testament to the script and the actors, man. I mean they're they're great. Principal photography, fifteen days, seventeen days, something like that. I was reading. Uh, yeah. It's hard. It's hard to nail down. It was something like eighteen, but some days were like half days, like okay. nighttime. But um, but also we shot all those films within the film, the mm-hmm. little pieces. Those are done separately. Separately, okay, early in the months preceding. Three weeks, four weeks, less yeah. than that. You, sure. You shot a movie. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now who edits this movie? We do. We do. You guys do. Yeah. 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 yeah, we just co-edit. We actually... <laughs> yeah, we, we have our own... We have, without talking about it, we have our own secret trick to editing. But I will say from a technical standpoint, the one thing we, we do do... Um, that I'll reveal is that one of us will edit a scene and then the other one will edit another scene and then we'll switch and then we'll go back to it and we'll double check we'll double check the the takes that were picked and if there's if the discussion needs to be had over which performance was better or whatever then we have it yeah. wow. but, but we had our we were editing on set like we'd, we'd wrap I mean the days were super smooth so we'd wrap by nighttime because we just use a lot of mm-hmm. natural light. I mean actually the movie is lit we have we had a full package but just very minimally, very, very minimalist. And that's kind of just a decision we made. We could have done it big, but that wouldn't have worked for resolution. Um, so meaning, like when the sun went down, we stopped shooting. And normally I had a schedule, which was pretty cool. And, uh, and we'd go to our cabin. And uh, you know, we'd, we'd eat with the crew and grab some beer. And then we'd go to our cabin. And we'd cut the scene we shot that day. How big a crew? Uh, 12? I think, yeah, I think the biggest, the biggest it ever got was 17 or 18 people. Really? For the final scene. Yeah, I think that night it was... That was the biggest. Oh, yeah, because we had make we had one makeup artist. We actually had an extra grip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And everything went smooth. This is so unusual smooth. to hear on right? the first yeah, independent but, film. You, you know what? Well, it's not our first though. We've yeah, been doing it for yeah, we, we know we it, know the pitfalls. We really yeah, know. it it was. We're we're of that generation of filmmakers where it's like we've done so many projects at this point because everything's so accessible now in filmmaking. Look at these cameras shooting us right now. Yeah, like look, I can. Look how much bootleg editing software there is. Like everyone yeah, has everyone cameras has and it. editing yeah. software, and you can get you can steal some CS5, CS6, iPhone movies. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And that's kind of we were talking about this earlier today. It's just like like if you want to be a filmmaker and you own an iPhone, you've got no excuse. Just get your iPhone out, man, and you make know, that's a movie. Uh, what we were talking about before we started, and the people I've interviewed and talked to, they all say the same thing: is just with today's equipment and access to equipment and the. Money threshold is pretty low. Right. Yeah. Uh, to get into making buy yourself a, a, a Zoom H four N and a T two I. You spent yourself eight or nine hundred dollars. And you can make a movie. And you can make a very good, good movie. movie. That, yeah. That's that's quality to play. So on, it, on they're a all saying the same thing. Just yeah. do it yourself instead of waiting for Hollywood to give you a job. Uh, yeah. Make your own project. Earn it, earn it man. Right. Yeah. You can yeah. work your way up a ladder, but you'll be miserable for those twelve years it takes you. And even working your way up is a little tough. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's no guarantee. There is no ladder. You know, actually. It, yeah. You know what though? Uh, this is this is something we always like to bring up though. As you said, you know, yes, during principal photography, pre-production, post-production, that was all very smooth because we had, had so much experience. And I'm not going to say the script wasn't ambitious. It was ambitious in a lot of ways, but from a technical standpoint. We knew we could achieve everything in that script, and we knew how much time it took, and we knew we didn't even need a first AD. We mm-hmm. could just go and do it. However, when the movie was completed, that 
was something we had never been through before. Because that idea of like, okay, now we have a feature, we're very proud of it, it's getting a very good when response. When you say completed, you mean after the editing or after the post After, after post-production, everything. everything. We had finished it. Now you have, we have a project. Okay. Now we have a review. Let's go that. Let's go yeah. that. So now, because oh. you guys did it all yourself. Right, right. Now what do you do with this baby you got? That is a wonderful question, because that was the only place where we really hit some very emotional snags. Because you go into it with like, uh, like you know, you're idealistic. You're like, oh my God, we're going to make a good movie. And you're pretty sure you're, we're confident, and we yeah. did it, and it's getting such a great response. And then we start going to people that we know that have done like the top tier film festival circuit, and they're telling us, "No, you guys, there's no chance. You're not getting." They'll, they'll say like your movie's festivals. good, yeah, yeah, but, but it just not. doesn't work like that. Yeah, it doesn't work like that. What do you mean it doesn't work like that? Here, here's the thing: nepotism in film festivals is greatly exaggerated. It, it, is. it is. It is. It is. It is. It is. It is exaggerated. People that say those people that told us that they were wrong. Because look, we got into Tribeca Film Festival and sold our movie there. However, we were the outlier. If you really, we are the outlier. And if you really think about it, you take a festival like the Sundance Film Festival. Part of their mission is to cultivate new filmmaker talent. Now you part don't. Of it, yeah. yeah, part of it. But how how do you cultivate new filmmaker talent by just taking their short film and not not paying special attention after you put them through the lab, after you put out the short film, and then they have a feature. If you were to not give that person some sort of special consideration, that would be not cultivating new filmmaker talent. And so, so is that nepotism? Yes. Right. But is it wrong? I don't think so. Okay. Well, also, also, but but does it be very clear though? Like like they're not going to take a film that sucks out of their lab. It's yeah. not it's not like they're like totally. It's not like a corruption thing. It's literally like oh like I know you personally. I'm going to watch your movie, mm -hmm. and I'm a programmer for the festival, I'm not the intern. That's that's all it is. That's, that's all it's not. You know, it, like, we're not saying there's like we're definitely not saying there's any kind of like corruption. It's more like like well yeah we we knowing we, somebody I gets to watch you for it. a month exactly. it doesn't mean you know, it's going to be in the film it, festival right exactly right, right. and it, so knowing people is always going to help absolutely is it absolutely it's all about relationships and knowing people and yeah. getting to know you know and so you got this movie made mm -hmm. and now you decide. You're going to take it to the film festivals and what? look for distribution? What's the process? What happens? The festivals first. Yeah. First we, festivals. We, and the reason for the festivals? We want to meet girls. You want to meet well, girls. Honest, <laughs> finally, I got an honest answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, finally. Yeah. No. That, that is the other, the other is the honest, honest answer. But the other thing is, too, is that, okay, so we made, we, you make a choice. You make a low budget movie, you make a choice. Are you going to go? like the top tier film festival route? Are you gonna go like the more like regional, regional smaller film festival route and then work maybe hopefully that'll get the notice of some of the bigger ones? Or are you gonna go straight out to distributors? Now if, if you want a bigger sale and you want more publicity and you want the prestige, you just go directly out to top tier film festivals. The problem is what we just talked about. Is that is getting in, the, getting in there. You're breaking the through 10,000 other features. And actually, here, and let, me, let me just pause for just a quick sec. Just, just for, the way that you get into a top tier film festival is yes, you can blind submit, and that's what happened, and we got in, and we were the outlier. The the, the what what the fact is is there's a, a gigantic level. It's not like there's a pool of of eighty programmers. It's not like that. It's like there's a pool of a hundred and fifty interns, and then twenty programmers, and then like the head programmers, like three of them. You know. So the interns so watch all the movies. If you can skip the interns. You know what I mean? Yeah, and just, yeah, yeah. just get to the programmers. Literally, just if you can have somebody say to a programmer, like, hey, my friend made a film, just this just is what it's called, just it. make sure you watch it. That's going to help you big time. And it's not, again, it's not corruption, it's not nepotism, it's just like, well, if somebody recommended a restaurant to you, are you going to do that? Or are you sure. going to just drive down the street until you find one? You know, like, that's what it is. So now you're getting the film festivals, and that's to get exposure. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, no, you, you the, story the, the, the uh, exposure for the movie. Yeah, I mean, if you can get into one of these top tier film festivals, which is like, you know, six to ten, depending on how you define it, then your movie is going directly into a competitive sales market where it could possibly spark a bidding more. And it's also going into a place that is a publicity machine, which is wonderful for your career. Now, we very naively only submitted to those top film festivals. So how many? Five, six festivals? It was like six festivals. Six festivals. It was like Sundance, Tribeca, South by Southwest, Toronto International, and uh, yeah. a couple others. Okay. Maybe, right? Yeah. Now, us not knowing anyone, those people saying, like, you don't know anyone you're not going to get in, they were actually right. Yes, you probably should. They're have. totally correct. Yeah, 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 yeah. Did you get into all six you submitted? No, no we did not. We got okay, there, does there it. Does it cost you money to submit your film? Absolutely, it does. It does. It, I put it in the budget. I yeah. put it in the budget. So we each film festival has a fee to submit your movie. They have a lot of money from the resolution budget. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we pay all our submission fees. And um, two things happened. Number one, there was one assistant at Tribeca Film Festival, the assistant to Jeffrey Gilmore, his name was Billy Goldberg, William Goldberg. He watched our movie, 
it struck a chord with him and he called us up and he said, look, I'm the low man on the totem pole, but I love your film. Is the world premiere available? That's your bargain. So voice. what's that phone call like for you guys? Oh. <laughs> that was when we broke open our stuff. Scotch. That's when you broke open the <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and, but, and he was he was very frank with us. He's like, look, I probably, I, I don't know what I'm I'm the little guy in the totem pole. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but I would like to, I just want to know, is the world premiere available? That's the one bargaining chip we have. I only go into top And by world premiere, I mean, you haven't shown it anywhere. Yeah. No one's seen it besides That's the you guys one cut screening. Yeah. 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 No film festivals. No film festivals. Okay. That is the reason why we only submitted to top tier film festivals. It's still a poor reason. It's the okay. one reason. It's like, well, we have our world premiere. And that's what they wanted to know. So right. Is your world premiere available? So we were like, yes, 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 yes. We're celebrating drinking single malt scotch. And then we wait three months. And we contact him every once in a while. The man is an angel. And he's like, oh, I'm trying, you guys. I'm trying. And he did it. He, yeah. he lobbied us through the other programmers. Into Tribeca. Yes. Into Tribeca. But, but something that's very, very important is that simultaneously, there was another man in Montreal named Mitch Davis who runs Fantasia Film Festival, mm-hmm. which is one of the biggest, most prestigious film festivals mm-hmm. in the world. He had gotten resolution in the mail, and he didn't hand it to an intern. He didn't hand it to his you assistant. You mailed it to him, obviously. We mailed yeah. it to him with a $60 check. Which, by the way, we found out is like, cr- like really crude and old-fashioned. Yeah, apparently it's all like online yeah. screeners and stuff now. Like, like to, to be, It's like, I got it in the mail. <laughs> yeah, like, he remembers it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so he, he, gets, yeah. he gets it. Well, no, we didn't mean to be unique. We just thought that's how you do yeah. it. I went to the, I went to the <laughs> website. It said, it said, send a $60 like, check to Fantasia Film Festival and with your the DVD. Movie. Yeah. Nowadays, so, nobody asks for a DVD. Like, they, they're all just like, give me the link. You know, so. Oops. So, we, yeah. so, so, we, so simultaneously, while Billy Goldberg, like an angel, is lobbying it to Jeffrey Gilmore, the man that used to run Sundance Film Festival, and eventually Tribeca accepts us, simultaneously, there's this guy in Montreal who, who got it in the mail. It was a very powerful and independent film. I think even Quentin Tarantino has a quote that he's like, you know, one of the gods of indie film. Okay. And he gets our DVD and he watches it. He doesn't hand it to an intern, doesn't hand it to an assistant. Mitch Davis watches it. He watches like seven and writes us movies writes like us an email. I think your movie's brilliant. I want to take it. I please want. I want the premiere. Another bar with the international premiere. Bring out another one. Yeah, yeah. And, and then he went out to like his network of international film festival programmers and like pitched it on everyone. Yeah. We didn't know this, but lately, okay. like later, we were accepted to these amazing film festivals in Switzerland. Okay, so and now you got you got Tribeca and mm-hmm. Fantasio. Simultaneously, yeah. Tribeca wants it because it's not. There's no world premiere yet. Right. Yes. But so but Tribeca is both for Fantasia. Okay. Well, Fantasia just wanted the international premiere, I which see. ended up getting taken by an amazing film festival in Switzerland. But Fantasia still took us. They still took us mm. as the Canadian premiere. Mm. So yeah. now you're out in the film festivals. Good response. Good reviews on the movie. Oh my god! It's it's honestly this film That's has so been the dream. The dream of an indie filmmaker because you're always bracing yourself and, and we're still bracing ourselves because our video on demand just came out yesterday or today so how do you make your and money back or what do you do after the film festivals i mean we've got an audience full of people who want the, to be in movies and make movies yeah, yeah, right? yeah and you guys have actually done it right, right. yeah and well, the good thing here okay so interrupt, is you guys funded it yourself so you're not beholden to somebody who's giving you money for this who could say send it to more film festivals or do something different you guys are pull, calling all the right. shots here yeah the, the, when you have an independent success like Resolution, it's not, it's not the money directly from the film. Right. That is that that is like the thing you're it's banking on. It's 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 what it does for you in the future. Like currently, when we leave here, we'll go get paid to mix the current film we're working. So now you start getting hired to do other right. jobs. This is like exactly. your resume. Like you might, yeah. I mean, like Resolution it's, is a profitable film. It's an extremely profitable film because it was right. done so cheap. Right. So um, like we made money on resolution, although it all ends up into a weird, you know. But basically, the the, the not now. Like I haven't. But seen resolution it in my pockets, makes money by you sell a distributor. You get a, you get a sales agent uh, who you know takes a fee to because they know all the distributors, and then the distributors come to your screening, and then they bid on with the sales agent. That's how it happens. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it, it basically was that dream where it basically sold the nine after its premiere. Yeah. It we got from sort of people. So try back on distribution for lack of a better term. Buys your film, takes it over. Yeah. No, then they, they buy the film. Mm-hmm. Then they distribute it. Let other distributors. No, they are the distributor they for North America. For North, North America. America. North America. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that's basically you know that's kind of how that happens. And then uh, for you as a filmmaker, you know that again I haven't seen that money in my pocket, but it, you know maybe eventually there's there's like a financially the way it works is interesting, but the um, the the fringe benefits are 
you then get approached by managers and you get a manager and then you get approached by people who have seen the film and you go and take meetings all over town uh, somebody affectionately called it the Evian Trail because they always offer you a bottle of water when you get there. You know, okay, so I could have gotten away with giving you water. Right. Well, <laughs> um, but but you know, so that's you know, and then you know, you take meetings with with all you know. So now, like you know, you take meetings at the big production companies, and whether or not that turns into something, in the same way that like, oh, I know a programmer. You know, now we just you know, we know someone. You could not have got these meetings without this movie. Right. Right. right, right, and so that's that's just how it happens. Is like, and and it's not, you know, it's just you get in the right doors, and those meetings might pay off tomorrow, or they might pay off ten years from now. But they'll be like, oh, you made that cool movie resolution, you know, and I met you, and you were fun to talk to, and I can get along with you. So right? low budget indie film, more like a resume. You don't. What I'm trying to tell people is, don't make it to make money. Make it yeah. because you love it. It's a passion. You can make money. Yeah, right? but it's a passion. Money may come, may not it's come, a and you don't know where it's going to come from. Other right. jobs, other hires, exactly. writing another movie, maybe just directing right. somebody else's movie. On the flip side of that coin, don't make unprofitable art house films. Please make movies because this is a business, and we do have to make money. Okay. In terms of like what we did, like the point of us making it is to, it, it is to not to make money, but to make something big. Is for our second movie. You know what I mean? Like, and because to tell an interesting story. Okay, so that's how about some of these guys who, who are making movies? What if you did not get the buzz at, and got into one film festival or one or two, and nothing much came out of it? Mm-hmm. What do you do then? Where do you go I, from there? Well, you know, that's save more money, make another movie. Sure, I mean you can sure. do that, but there's also it's you know the route we went is sort of the the fairy tale long shot route. There's the other one too, where it's like. Okay, you submit to some smaller regional festivals, and from there you can generate enough buzz to do a whole bunch of those smaller regional festivals that will eventually culminate in you know it's probably as much as much buzz as we did. Right. There's other ways to do it. You don't or, have to get into the least top. Films. Or heck, you know, let's say that film festivals just don't like your film. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. One reason or another. Let's okay. just say they don't take it. You know, because that's still a gamble. Mm-hmm. Is you make your movie, you sell it for as much as you can, you show that it's profitable on paper, you show an investor and say, look. Yeah, it made money. It made, made money. Let's this. do another. We made money on it. So just start, start movie. building up. You know, I mean, just build up. Keep making movies. So, so. for the, for for the audience, uh, you guys, experienced guys, worked on other stuff and all, but this is your first move, indie movie together. Right. Okay. Anything surprising you didn't expect? It's uh, a good question. No, I mean, uh, the business side of it of like when the movie is sold, and they're like, "Well, you need an attorney for this, this, and that," and where's all this other stuff you've never heard of before for delivery. And we handled it just fine, you know? Right. Again, that do-it-yourself spirit kicks in and you just get it done. Um, but I mean, that film was... festivals were probably the biggest, like, eye-opener. Because I always, the, the way, here's, here's the vision that I think most people have of film festivals, and definitely and the you one had that I held, okay. is, is there are, you know, there are, these, there are these large film festivals and they receive a ton of movies and they accept the ones that they like. And that's basically, it's that simple. You know, there is so much politics. And not, 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 I'm not talking about corruption, I'm talking about politics. Okay. Of just like, you take this movie, if like, uh, like the sales agent will even like say, not, not for our, our case, but like it can happen in the way that like the sales agent will say like, it, I'll give you this movie, which is like the rock star movie. This movie has, that, it still has its too. premiere, but you gotta take it too. And so the festival has a decision to make, you know? And it's one of those things like, it, like there's that kind of stuff just happens. So in these the are the festivals that you didn't know, you know weren't aware of. These are, I completely understand how festivals work now, like maybe not completely, but at least oh. much more now. And again, it's it's totally legit. It's I like the way that they work. Okay, you know they're wonderful. And and the, and the other thing too that we didn't realize, and this is like extremely important that every filmmaker should know and every human being, is that um, film festivals, particularly European genre film festivals, oh are the best thing on the planet. Oh ever created by man, woman, send anything. Their film. They are oh. amazing. The you fool, go watch. I bet Kitty the Fool <laughs> that, that submits their film to a European film <laughs> festival gets accepted and just says like, well, I hope it plays well and doesn't go. You fool! Go! <laughs> go! Because it's at first... So, oh, man. I, I, I mean, I, I could list off experiences we've had in the last six months, whether it was George A. Romero walking up to Aaron in Sweden and saying, I really enjoyed Resolution. Right. George wow. A. Romero walked up to Aaron and said that. Or it was hanging out with Kieran Foy, the director of Citadel, who we admire so, very much. Or like, right. like making or like, new like friends. In Paris, or like, so, we're like we wrap our we wrap our Paris like introduction and they're like, hey, you guys are really cool. Let's go down to the catacombs tonight. So where in, you know, like, where in like, Europe did you go? Which, which places? 
Oh man, you ready? Paris. Here it goes. Okay. All right, all right. Uh, help me here. So we went to Canada for Toronto and Montreal. Okay. Uh, and we've been all over the U.S. So we'll skip those for now. We've been to Sheffield, the U.K., London, um, uh, Paris, Strasbourg, Strasbourg. Lund, Sweden, uh, uh, Copenhagen, Tallinn, Estonia, Trieste, Italy, Neuchatel, Switzerland, uh, San Sebastian, Sebastian, Spain. 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 Uh, um, we hit Germany briefly. Um, and these yeah. are all film festivals there. Um, yeah. All now amazing who, film festivals with massive audiences and amazing people hanging out. Who pays, who, who pays to go there? They do. They pay they pay do. <laughs> <laughs> not all of it. Not, once all, not all of it. Once they, they accept for, your movie, then they pay to get you yes. up there. Yeah. Yes. Not, not, they, I mean, like, some of it. But, okay. but enough that, like, well, Once you're go. there, it's easy and inexpensive to travel around. At so, least somebody look, got you they, there. They love to take care of you. Really? Some, some of them put you in hotels that... They're definitely nicer I, than my house. Nicer than anything I've ever been allowed to be at. Like I'm there and I'm like, am I gonna get kicked out like in the next yeah, yeah. five like, minutes? They're gonna like, I'm gonna be like you. What do are you? Do you remember in San Sebastian? We like mm. open, we open the oh, window God. and there's just like a cove and the breeze <laughs> and we're like, and there's like, there's like a, there's like a robe, there's like a robe <laughs> for us to wear. <laughs> there's a movie in this. It was preposterous. It was, it was just so one of those things. Crazy. We're like laughing at how much we don't deserve this. It's like a movie. Really? It's I mean. Going to those film festivals, besides the publicity, which is gigantic, by the way, to make no, to make no mistake, it, for, for business purposes, it's very important to travel with your film. It makes a huge difference to who you meet, to like uh, getting your audience there, ready. Yeah. You know, they, they, it's a big difference to the film What festival. kind of audiences, what size audiences at these film festivals? Packed. Roughly, packed. I mean, packed. hundreds of thousands. Uh, what so, uh, uh, Montreal was 800 people. Okay. Yeah. And Toronto was roughly the same. And by the way, for some reason, you start to notice uh, differences in audiences around the world. Oh, yeah. They're yeah, all yeah. great, but for some reason, Toronto film audiences it's are crazy. like, yeah. they, they are, I, the way they emotionally internalize movies and the way you can like sit in the audience and, and actually the emotions of 800 too. people is like the craziest experience. Yeah. Like every scare, every laugh, when it's done, the exhale and the... Because it's not just our movie. We've seen a bunch of movies in all of the cities. So we can tell you exactly how Parisian audiences are. We can tell you exactly how Swiss and, and Swedish and, and Estonian audiences are. So when did you... When was this movie completed? When did it go... When did Tribeca take it? What uh, year? I mean, they took it in March two thousand twelve. That's what, or, no, I'm sorry, late February two thousand twelve. But they, they, we got the phone call in November, so that was a long that's three months. That was three months. So yeah. now, from February of two thousand and twelve, how long is your whole film festival journey? Six months, eight we months. We just ended. Yeah, we kind of. We, we were still on one year, almost. Yeah, almost. We we kind we kind of just uh, made a self imposed ending to it because we have to stay focused on the next thing. That being we're said, still there's that. still some that we already agreed to because it was like, hey, do you guys want to come to Brazil? And we're like, no, I'm oh, just no, kidding. Yeah, we're going to Brazil. Brazil. Yeah, yeah, no, we're to. <laughs> if you don't go, I'll go. Okay, that's yeah. fine, actually. Let's not, um, let's not go. What kind of equipment? I mean, technically, what did you use to shoot this movie? Uh, shot on the red. On the red. Um, and we had maybe a one and a half ton grip package and my gaffer. And that was it. Where do you go from here? Uh, uh, from film wise. Dr- you oh, got another project. Uh, we yeah. actually literally go directly from here back to our mix on the west side. Where yeah. We're mixing. We we got this really neat opportunity to shoot a a short film with a real budget by a new company that needs it for content for something they're going to launch this spring, and um, it turned out we're really happy with it. But we're in the sound mix on that right now, so we got to head across town to finish that up. And since Resolution premiered at Tribeca, um, we've written three more scripts that are tonally similar to Resolution, and we've been able to do business on those scripts while we're on the film festival circuit. In fact, we may have found locations for two of them that have formed... You're going to produce them yourself? You're going to get investors this time for you? Um, both. Well, we won't be, they won't be self-financed. I'll, I will continue to produce everything. But you'll um, get outside money for... Yeah, exactly. And we'll also work with other producers on all this stuff. That's when great. do you see yourself starting your next movie? Uh, our hope was to do it by this spring, but considering... Uh, Cannes Film Festival, where a lot of independent film business or film business in general is done, is mm-hmm. in May. Mm-hmm. We may have to be looking more like September, October. You're still going to make a nice, cool indie film, or now with, with bigger budgets, you're going to make a. It's going to be a lot. You're going to make a movie it's, you want to make. Gonna, right? We're still going to make the movie we want to make, and, and the key is. You can do that on like your fifth or sixth movie, maybe, mm-hmm. where it's like, oh, yeah, if you have like some oversight from someone that sucks, like, it's okay to bomb. You can't bomb yeah. your second movie. Not yeah. the second one. You know? And that's. Like, so you can take a risk on, court, on, on Big Brother oversight on like later movies, you know, but right now we really need to do it ourselves. And if the, the more control we have, the more secure we feel we are that it's going the next movie will be good. But we have to remain in as much control as possible. 
And the way you remain in control is by making small monetary progressions. Yeah. Where it's like, yeah, well, the next one will do for somewhere between half a million and a million. And then after that, a little bit more, a little bit more. So do you want to make big budget movies? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah we'd, we'd be, be really to. happy to. It just doesn't seem, it, it doesn't, like, in terms of, like, how we are viewed by, by Hollywood, I guess, yeah. is, like, we are, how would you describe it? We are the genre-bending, like, cool indie directors, but that doesn't, we are. We could probably be viewed as people that could be told what to do, which is fine because I understand that. But you know, if we got like a twenty or thirty million dollar budget, we're gonna have so many people telling us what to do that mm -hmm. we can't say no to you're because we haven't no proven movie. ourselves. Yeah, you're not and it's just no. one of those things where it's like, well, maybe those decisions will be right, but what if they're not? Yeah. And then we've just made a now, stinker for twenty or thirty million. You want to? You, know? you write these scripts. Both of you collaborate. Write a script. You don't want to sell it to somebody else. You want to make that movie. Yeah. Right. You yeah. don't want to sell and the script to somebody else. Or... Yeah. Yeah, and, and again, the, the the desire to do bigger budget movies doesn't supersede the desire to just make a good movie, and making good yeah, movies. Rent just fine. Yeah. Like every do just make a good movie. <laughs> we can do a music video. We can do a commercial. Whatever. We don't want a bad movie on IMDb, and we don't want to devote a year of our lives to a bad movie. Um, and the other thing, to, and and again, the, the way that we can ensure that we're continuing to make good movies is just to make every time the budget gets a little, a little bigger, bigger and we're proving to people that look, if we remain in control, these things will turn out good. See, because what I love about this whole digital indie movie revolution is it's character driven, actor driven, script driven, and it's not all CGI and mm -hmm. you know, it's like yeah. movies used to be 50 years ago, you know, yeah, it's not yeah. the, there's a place for Hollywood to make Spider-Man and Superman and the big things, but I enjoy the there's heck out so of many but, yeah. great indie films that are shot in one location, in one room, and you know, uh, that are all character. So it starts with a great script. If you had to give advice to people who are watching this and who are aspiring filmmakers and all that, what's the biggest advice you, bit of advice you could give them? And because you guys, I mean, mm -hmm. you took a script, you wrote a script, a labor of love, and you made it work. You finished the movie, you got it distributed, you've gone all over the world with it. Um, this is what most people want to do with their movie. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think it happens for most people who are making their movie. No, what true. advice would you give them? The, the only reason we've been able to do what we do is because we put in, you know, the, roughly that whatever they say, it's 10,000 hours or whatever it is mm -hmm. into what we do. That's the only reason we've been able to do what we do and, and have the success is because in our lives in the last 10 or so years, we've done thousands and thousands of hours of doing that. So I feel like if you do that, if you put in your thousands and thousands of hours, some people say it's ten thousand, but yeah. Hours, that that yeah, like eventually you'll you'll have that success with that thing you like to do. If you just move to LA and you're like, I'm a director. That's right, which is what a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Or I'm an actor. Yeah. Right. You, what have you acted in? You probably won't Nothing. get paid to be a director actor. And at, yeah. but at the same but time, but if you're directing movies on the weekend and you call yourself yeah. a director, good. It's expected. It also keeps you in practice and it keeps you, yeah. you know, you're not rusty. I mean, you, you can't just suddenly be a surgeon without having. Sure. You, know, sure. you can't just suddenly be The a only thing that, that bothered me is when someone's like, I'm a director, and then at night, instead of directing stuff or working on their next project, they go and play Halo 4. Yeah. Play. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's just like, it's like you're, you know, I mean, you. it's fine to, to relax, but if you're a director and you're not being paid to direct, Still direct work something. towards getting it's it. It's like you said, yeah. even with an iPhone, make a two minute movie. Just go do it. And just something. go do it. Yeah. yeah. And take right. risks. Because because it's it, it film is now cheap. You know, like yeah. like shooting is now cheap. Take risks, do something so different. So in, in wrapping up over here, where where can people see your movie? Amazon yeah. Instant, Anywhere Voodoo, in any any PS three or Xbox in America can get it or in can in Canada. Yeah. Um, also uh, any video on demand, Time Warner, Comcast, Verizon, Bright House, whatever. Is that where most indie films are going? Is video on demand? Is that the portal yeah. to Yeah. Yeah. It's a great market too. Yeah. It's a great market. It's, and video it's, on demand that's how I want to see movies. You want to see it, you pay for it, you watch the movie. And you don't have to worry about the fact that your distributor may be paying like $20 million for prints and advertising to make people, for sure people see it. It's yeah. less move money for the recoup. Your, your movie, I feel like, is you've upped the chances that it's going to be profitable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which is, which is, which is always good for getting the next movie. When made. I interviewed uh, Michael Bean and even Matthew Lillard, they said the threshold's so low that a little bit of profit, you don't have to come in with, you know, yeah. 80 million in the first weekend and or right. it'll flop you know right, so right. it gives you enough juice in the game to make another movie because exactly. you did make money on the movie yeah. um in closing anything any advice anything you want to say more about the movie that i skipped or missed as far as us as filmmakers go we're really really open and and social networking is super important as a filmmaker even to so, promote your movie of course
Well, yeah. throughout our movie, just talking about filmmaking, we love it. Yeah. So tweet at us, you know, which is and, and we will answer. You know, cool. we we'll put all that up on the sure. uh, on the on our blog. We put all your yeah. Info I mean, we will there. always answer, and we're really accessible. And, and I answer. There's a 13 year old kid that's been emailing me about visual effects, and I answer every single one. It's just like it's it's cool, yeah, man. Get into filmmaking. It is. It you know? is. Like I love it. And for so, anyone watching on VOD, your best experience: play it loud and get highly caffeinated. Mm -hmm. It'll make the scares hit that much harder. Keep your keep keep, your, yeah. keep it down. Keep the lights down low. Yeah. Just and, and have have a girl with you and put your arm around. It's gonna happen. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guys, thank you so much thank for you. coming in, man. Thank you. Great meeting you. Thanks guys. for the balcony. Uh, wish you all the best with the movie, and um, I know we'll be hearing your names again, man. Great. 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 Thank Thanks, guys.